attendant from New York. I can talk in four to five hundred miles an hour with gusts up to seven, eight hundred words a minute. <clears throat> Anybody here from New York? I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> okay, I'm not those. He was good. How did he do that? Spade, I stayed up all night wondering how did he do that? And the thing is, I don't want him to tell me. I don't want to know. It was better not knowing. Because it was a trick, right? I mean, it was a trick. It was a trick. Like, he didn't really read my mind. <laughs> Come up and just read my mind? Well, last night, he told me the four words that I was thinking about that I wrote down on a piece of paper that nobody else would possibly know. One of the words was a word he'd never heard before. How did he come up with that? Yeah, the exact four words. Two names and two place names. One of the places he had never heard of. Didn't know where it was. Had never heard the word. You didn't want to embarrass him by showing him how easy it was? He wouldn't tell you. Yeah. It's more fun to be fascinated by him than to know how he did it. <laughs> He's kind of like watching Usain Bolt. How did he do that? How did he do that? Okay, we have in our midst the man who has been running for almost 50 years. He has the logbook to prove it. How did Usain Bolt do that? Any ideas, Schultz? How did he do that? How did he run 9.58? How is it possible? The bananas. Anybody see Usain Bolt's nutrition video? Yep. He holds up some bananas, he holds up some a couple other pieces of fruit, and says when it comes to nutrition, these are my tools. And this is it for me when it comes to nutrition. That's all he said and got off skates, 30 seconds. He's quick, you know, he's really quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I got interested in fasting back in the 70s. It was a fascinating thing to me. It just seemed kind of cool. Uh, I was raised in a Jewish household. We fasted every year on Yom Kippur. That's a dry fast, you go 24 hours on nothing. Seemed perfectly normal to me to go the 24 hours, during which time you're supposed to review your deeds of the year, repent for the ones that um, weren't up to snuff, and, and promise at least to yourself that you're going to do better in the year to come. You know, I mean, when you're dry fasting, you'll promise almost anything. So <laughs> at that point, we promised, and, and it wasn't so bad. 24 hours isn't a big deal. Uh, of course, before it started, we ate as much as we could, and after it ended, we ate as much as we could. It probably wasn't the best way to go about fasting. But it wasn't unfamiliar to me. I, I heard that there's, there's been a few religious leaders that fasted uh, long periods of time in the desert, and, and some political leaders that have done it too, with various definitions of what is fasting. The dictionary says fasting means to abstain from, I'm having trouble with my voice here. Fasting uh, means to abstain from, and yet in the vernacular, most people use fasting, meaning that's the thing they're on. And so we have juice fasting. I mean, you're not abstaining from juice, you're on juice. <laughs> or watermelon fasting, or whatever it might be. Fruits and, I had a guy tell me one time he was on a fruits and vegetable fast. So, ah, I guess I've been on one for 27 years. <laughs> I don't see an end in sight. Well, 
as I mentioned earlier in the week, the hygienic view of what is fasting is not really so much about abstaining from, it's about what do you give yourself, and what you give yourself is as much rest as possible. Fasting happens after you slow down from running, from walking, from standing, from sitting, from lying down, after you slow down from all the cares and worries and concerns that you have in life, after you stop with all the input that's coming in from everywhere, you turn off the radio, television, and the other forms of electronic input as much as humanly possible, you get to a situation, you stop eating. You get to a point where your digestive system says, all's quiet on the lower front. And you can absolutely go beyond rest into fasting state. You're not working at all. While you fast, all facets of health vector towards normal. All facets of anatomy and physiology vector towards health. We see this every single night of the year. Well, almost every night for most of us. You get to the end of the day where you can't go anymore. You're just plain pooped. And then you go to bed and you rest as deeply as you possibly can. You turn off the noise, you turn off the lights, you close your eyes, you pull the covers over yourself and disappear into as close to hibernation as you can get. You don't wake up in the middle of the night and do push-ups in order to get a better night's rest. You don't wake up in the middle of the night and eat a pound of almonds in order to get a better night's rest. You rest by doing nothing, making nothing an activity, a verb. What are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> Intentionally, with intelligence. I'm doing as little as possible. I'm trying to sleep, if you would just stop asking me questions. What are you doing? I'm fasting. I'm fasting every single night of the year from as early as possible till as late as I care for the next day. For most people, most of the time, they wake up and they eat a meal relatively early on. What do they call it? Break fast. Okay. What do they call it in Spanish? Break fast. They actually use fast as a word, ayuno. So, we recognize that we fast every single night. We went to bed exhausted. We wake up ready to face the day, usually. Sometimes we didn't fast enough. There's times where you would rather roll over than roll out. How many people, when faced with that option, have the freedom in their life to be able to roll over rather than roll out? A few. It's great. How many don't? A lot. And that's part of life. There's a trick, in case you didn't know, there's a trick to waking up ready to roll out rather than roll over at the designated time. Go to bed earlier. <laughs> go to bed. You don't miss anything when you go to bed. <laughs> the TV show really isn't that important. The dishes will wait. So will the postcard you were needing to write as will the ironing and everything else. It'll wait, but your health won't wait. There is no adaptation 
to less sleep. You just pay for it with your life. In little increments. Question. Go to bed. It's the biggest secret we've got. You already have the other one. Eat fruit. Now go to bed. <laughs> Eat fruit and go to bed. It's a very simple program. But we don't often enough go to bed often enough. And what happens is we lose just a little bit of ground. And you wake up in the morning and you roll out and you're functional, but you'd have rather rolled over. But you got to get up. Things to do, people to meet, places to go, stuff that won't wait. And you start doing it and you manage to get through your day. You do it again and again and again and again. And one of two things eventually happens. You either absolutely, totally break down and get sick. In which case your body says, told you to go to bed. Now I'm going to put you to bed. <laughs> or the body breaks down in more insidious ways and you pay for your loss of health with chronic rather than acute degenerative conditions. There's no getting away with it. There's no time out. Body's always watching. The clock is always running. You need to take care of your health or you pay for it. One way or another. There's no way around it. You pay with a shortened life. Or you pay with illness. Or you pay with, pro with reduced productivity. Or you get a little edgy, sketchy, irritable, not so much fun to be around. You ever notice you get a little more irritable when you haven't had quite enough sleep? You ever see how kids are when they get not quite enough sleep? We're the same way. What you do is you start accruing a debt, a health debt. And at some point, you either get really sick and your body says, I'm putting you to bed. Or, you say, you know what? I haven't been getting enough rest a lot of times for a long time. It's time that I gave myself an adult-sized portion of rest. Instead of resting for eight hours, I'm thinking about resting for eight days. I'm thinking about taking eight weeks. It's an odd thing. When I started studying about fasting, I started studying more seriously about fasting. What I found out is that people used to go to fasting retreats to get well when they were sick. No different than now. The difference was that they would go until they got well. Because that was the whole point. Because they were farmers, or they were whatever they were, and they had to function in life. Nowadays, people don't do that. Nowadays, people go, I've got 17 days, I can take a fast. I gotta go home on day 18. And I go, I can't actually choreograph the speed with which your body will get well. That's not up to me. I don't do that. Your body runs that show. It's like, I got a cut. It needs to heal in four hours. <laughs> People used to go to health retreats. I've talked to some of the owners of these health retreats that, that ran in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. And they say, oh yeah, people come for a year, 18 months, whatever it took. Come for two years. Well, it's a luxury that we can't even imagine, isn't it? I'm going to go to the health retreat for two years until I get well. And I'm going to be astonishing when I come home. Great. 
We think it's just not going to be a home when you come home. <laughs> so life is today what it is today. And we still, people come and they say, I've got a month. And you go, well, bless you. I'm glad you got a month. That's better than 18 days. We'll do what we can in the period of time we have, but I can't compress time. I've learned to do a bunch of really cool things. I can't compress time. Can't compress a fluid. Can't compress time. It's just how it is. You're going to get well at the speed that your body dictates. If we start to understand that what most people call detox, I call hangover. If you can relate to it like it's a hangover. Okay, it's not always a next day hangover. Heck, people in sports know you don't get a hangover the next day. Delayed onset muscle soreness can take two, three, four, five days before you get sore from what you did back then. We understand that. Why can't we understand that the, the toxins that were in the foods we ate in the 60s and 70s, which our kidneys couldn't deal with, and so they went to our liver, and our liver said, this is absolute overload. I'm really busy right now. <laughs> Throw it in storage. Where do we store it? In our fats. Primarily, not exclusively. Strontium, I think, is stored in our bone. But mostly it's in our fats. As long as you hang on to that fat, the toxins are with you. You lose the fat, 30 years later, 40 years later, you come and you fast, and you start losing the fat, and you're on day 17 of the fast, and you go, all night long, I've been thinking about fried chicken. I haven't had fried chicken in 32 years. Now I'm thinking about fried chicken, what's going on? And go, what do you think is coming out of your system? It's obviously on your mind. There's some, you're going through a hangover. You're getting it out of your system. Good. Because there's only two ways to avoid a hangover. You keep doing it or you stop doing it. But you got to lose the fat. For guys, that's down to like really single digit low-end, single-digit body fat. For ladies, it's very often getting into single-digit or the very lowest upper double-digit body fat and then going back up from there. That's cleaning house. Then you can rebuild your body using high-quality materials. Because even if you say, okay, look, I'm not in a rush, I'm gonna eat this way forever, I'm gonna take the next five to 10 years I'm going to really refine my diet. I mean, how many practice attempts do you get at Christmas dinner with your family per year? One. Most times when people show me things, say, springboard, I'm coaching a springboard diving team, and they go, Doc, I can do this trick. And they show it to me. And they show it to me, and of course I'm watching, so they mess up. And they go, I could do it, I did it before. You go, show me after you've done it 10 times in a row perfectly. Talk to me about having mastered 80, 10, 10 after you've got 10 Christmas dinners under your belt that went perfectly. You ate perfectly, you didn't get into a fight with your mom or your sister, dinner didn't turn into a disaster because nobody liked the smell of your durian and you didn't like the smell of their turkey and everybody fought with everybody else. There were no guilt feelings. You had a good day from start to finish and it really went the way you 
hoped that it would. Ten years in a row. And then you go, ah, oh, I think I'm getting the hang of this. I could go to like a wedding or something and handle myself amongst all that stuff that's there. I could go to a convention or a seminar. I could go maybe anywhere. I figured it out. Obviously, being healthy is far easier than being sick. And eating 1010, I think, is far easier than any other way. There's a lot less to learn. But we didn't learn it as children. Now we have to learn it as adults. What the heck is a ripe banana? When is it ready? Sean Kohler did a video where he, where he held up rambutan and tried to convince everybody that there was some kind of spiny sea vegetable thing that he was pulling out of the ocean. He dumped them in first, you know, and then in the video he pulls out these spiny sea urchins and he opens them up. <laughs> it was just good fun, but at the end he had to say, oh, by the way, these really are rambutan, they fell off trees. And If it came to it, and you weren't going to use variety names, because you can probably name 12 different kinds of apples, right? Who can name 12 different kinds of apples? For sure. But if we only said apple, orange, peach, pear, who can name 50 fruits? Who are those supposed to be the experts? <laughs> so, there is a lot to learn. We got to learn how much, we got to learn when, we got to learn how to ripen, we got to learn how to store, we have to learn how to buy, we have to learn the names of the darn things. We have to learn which ones we like, which ones are going to give us satiating value that's going to last and last and last, and which ones are going to be like something to eat because it's all about flavor. Who liked, who liked the long end this week? Absolutely fantastic flavor. Who ate a lot of them? No calories. Eat as many as you want. Okay, maybe there's one calorie or something. There's, there's like essentially no calories. Long end is eaten for flavor only. Okay, it's gotta be. There's lots of fruits like that. Eaten for flavor. So there's things to know when we fast, If I say lemon, how many people can taste it right now? We're, that's how O's did it. <laughs> or so he says, right? Lemon. And you all can feel it on, you don't feel it on the tip of your tongue, you feel it on the sides. Because that's where you taste sour, right? It's a pretty funny thing. Not like, oh, just imagine a lemon and you're drinking the juice. I mean that, like, and, oh, and, the sun, and your cheeks just go nuts. And everybody can feel that. Just say lemon, got it. Cherry, got it. It's not just in your brain that got it. Everything involved with cherry, all the way through the 50 feet of intestinal tract, went into play. Oh, cherry? Yeah. Kicks in, kicks in, kicks in. And in fact, oh man, somebody peeled peaches, blended them for you, added a little bit of OJ and a little bit of blackberry, and gave you a quart of nectar. And you're drinking it. Oh, isn't that good? You can almost feel it getting into your bloodstream by this point. There's a map. Your entire digestive system went into function. Do you think maybe while you're fasting, thinking about food might not be resting? <laughs> Talking about food and recipes might not be resting. Your, your digestive system is at complete calm. I'm putting a stethoscope on your belly and hearing nothing. 
Then we start talking about food, and all this gurgling and gurgling starts just churning. It's not resting. The ideal fast goes like this. You show up at a fasting retreat where they have awesome green all around you, big open vistas because It has been proven scientifically that we prefer big open vistas of trees to being in the middle of the jungle. We like to see the jungle but not be in it. We feel a little more comfortable that way, a little less claustrophobic, and your heartbeat slows, and your blood pressure goes down, and all the right things happen. Anybody read Biophilia or the Biophilia Experiment? They couldn't prove biophilia, so they hired 20 different teams of doctors and scientists from all fields of science to prove the antithesis of biophilia, biophobia. If, biophobia, if you actually do have, if human beings actually do have biophobic tendencies, then we must also, by, de by design, have biophilic tendencies. Bio is life, ability is love. It's a condition where you love life. Who oh, isn't that the cutest puppy you ever saw? Oh, isn't that wonderful? I like washing fish in a tank. Look at that. We saw one deer on the way up here. A little, a little fawn with all the spots on his back. You know, I was happy about that for a half an hour. Just, oh, that was the cutest little thing. <laughs> Puppies and bunny rabbits and kittens. We, we definitely, so you show up and it's green and it's clean and it's quiet and you can't hear any man-made sounds and the factory is 100 miles away, whatever the factory is, and, and you feel comfortable and you're welcomed and the staff says, drop everything, we'll take care of everything for you. Here, let me show you around. Relax. We've done this thousands of times. We know exactly how to make it perfect for you. Don't even worry about a thing. If you have any needs, call us. At which point, you go, well, the temperature's just nice. But I'm a little tired. I've been traveling. And you go to your room, and you close your eyes after you leave. And then somebody's pushing on your shoulder, saying, wake up, it's all over. You fasted for 24 days, it's over. Wake up, it's time to wake up, your fast is over. That would be the perfect fast. You sleep right through the whole thing, and when it's done, somebody says, oh, it's over. <laughs> they don't all always go just like that. But I've seen some come pretty close. I've actually seen some come pretty close. I had a young lady one time who had extreme, perhaps the worst case of trauma that I'd ever seen. Child abuse, like somebody in a horror movie would make. The whole town was in on it. And all the kids got it. But especially the good looking ones. And for a decade, there was nowhere to turn. She was a kid. As an adult, she married a guy who was as manipulative as her father used to be. You didn't yet know that. Came down to me to fast. And we met her pretty much the way I described and seen it be beautiful. And, and, and she was not outgoing. She wore a super wide brimmed hat pulled way down until the only thing you could see was little bits of her huge sunglasses that completely hid the rest of her face. With her iPod plugged in, she arrived incommunicado. Went to her room. I went in to talk to her for a few minutes. 
I have no idea what I said that instilled confidence in her. But somehow she said, I feel good, John. I feel comfortable. She went to bed. I checked in on her the next morning. She was still asleep. I checked on her the next afternoon. She was still asleep. I checked on her around dinner time that day, and she was just waking up and said, come on in, and we talked for a few minutes, and she said something really strange happened last night. I said, what was that? She said, since I was a child, I have never, ever had a night that didn't have nightmares, ever, until last night. No nightmares. I thought that was interesting. She had also slept for 22 hours. Over the course of the next 20 days, she averaged 21 hours of sleep per day. It was a near perfect bet. She's never had another nightmare in the last, now I think it's seven years. Never had another nightmare. I told her I know how to get you some if you want them. Eat a bunch of nuts right before you go to sleep. She said, no, I'll pass on that, thank you. Pretty astonishing to think that somebody could sleep more than 400 hours in 20 days. She needed to sort some stuff out. She's a completely different person now. We've seen so many miracles with people fasting for so many reasons. But to me, the real miracle is the fact that any of us survived childhood eating what we ate. How did we make it? People say to me, well, if I eat 80, 10, 10, and I stay active and healthy and take good care of myself, do I need to fast even once? And they go, well, if you want to get rid of all that crap that's in your system, for how long has it been there, since when, and rebuild your body with healthy materials, at least one fast is likely in your future, maybe more. Took me five fasts. I was reasonably healthy, I thought, but to get to the point where I was just beyond all that stuff and didn't want to think about it anymore and just wanted to, thought like taking good care of myself might be a treat. Honest. How many people still look at certain foods that are off the 80 10 10 program as treat? Be honest. <laughs> I'm going to hurt myself. It's going to be a treat. <laughs> Do you see the disconnect? It'll take time. You'll get there, or you won't. But hopefully you'll get there if you persist a bit. I saw a lady call, she called me up, actually her husband called me up, said, said, my wife has arthritis, it's kind of, it's really bothering her, would it be possible to fast with you? I said, sure, bring her. He brings her. I had a little policy, I always watched everybody get out of the car. <coughs> Very telling when people are getting out of the car. Two doors open, Hosra doesn't get out, somebody gets out the Front seat, passenger side, driver side, they both get out. They walk around, they open the back door. One goes in from one side, one goes in from the other side. And they help Hazra out. Actually, they carry her out. They created a little seat out of four hands and carried her into me, put her on the bed. And I realized that she can't walk. We're talking seriously debilitating arthritis. How long has she been this way? Two months. Hasn't been able to get out of bed for two months. Arms are crossed like a mummy. I go, can you pick them up? No. Can you wave? No. 
Can you open your hands? No. Can you wiggle your toes? No. Get her in a comfortable position. Put a sheet over her. It's summer in Florida, it's not, not too cool. Put a sheet over her. Doctor, could you take the sheet off my feet, please? The weight of the sheet hurts my feet. Day nine of a water fast. She goes, as I walk by. Day 14 of a water fast. She goes, I want to try to walk to the bathroom. I go, okay. That would be, that would be way better for us than what we've been doing. <laughs> I'll encourage you for that. I help her to the bathroom. She takes care of her own business. And then I hear, doctor. I go in and say, what? They're at the door, right? What? She goes, I can't get off the toilet. You know, they're low compared to, she hasn't been out of bed in two and a half months. She doesn't have the strength to stand up. Three weeks, she's functional. She's getting around by herself, but still has lots of arthritic tendencies. It took a month, it was the longest fast I've ever had for an arthritic, 30 days. They're usually between, the shortest was 19, the longest was 30, and at the end of 30 days, she had no hint, no sign, nothing that had anything to do with arthritis. We broke her fast. She said, I want to go home. I said, fine, no problem. As soon as you can do two things for me, you can go home. She goes, what are those? I said, you gotta be able to get up and down a flight of stairs without using the railing. She goes, I can't go up and down a flight of stairs with the railing. <laughs> I said, do you have stairs at your house? Yes. Well, then you have to be able to go up and down them before you go home. I said, what's the other thing? I said, you have to be able to get out of a chair without using your hands. She said, how do I get better at these things? I said, every time you want to eat, go up and down the stairs three times. You tell me you want to eat, I'll make you food. While I'm making it, you go up and down the stairs three times. I said, every time you sit down all day, every day, every time you sit down, do it twice. Sit down, get up, and sit back down. You'll be surprised how quickly you'll get better at it. 16 days later, we're having a kind of a party day. And I'm just walking into the room and everybody's breaking into, we have 14 people sitting at the table and everybody breaks into applause. I go, thank you. <laughs> but I just walked in. And I looked over and there's Hazra standing at the table. I said, oh. Did you stand up? She says, yes, once. And she sat down. And she stood back up by herself out of the chair. She got some more applause. And she said, and watch this. And she went over to the stairs and walked up and turned around and walked down without holding on to the rail. And said, that's just fantastic. She said, can I go home now? <laughs> I said, you can go home today. And she did, later that afternoon. Hemophiliac coming fast, who now no longer takes medication. Doctors told him it's incurable. Part of hemophilia is complicated. It's not just that you're a bleeder. There's all sorts of stuff that doesn't work right. His ankles were so deformed 
and he couldn't walk without pain. When he first asked about coming to fast, he said, is it far to the lectures from the rooms? I go, no, it's not far, it's about 100 feet. He's 100 feet. I can't walk that far. I said, hmm, I can't make it any closer. He said, don't worry, I'll crawl. Some people really want it. I'll crawl. Turns out he never did crawl. He managed to walk because by the second day of the fast, his ankles already felt better. The pain wasn't so severe. He never exercised in his whole life. A, because his joints were deformed, and B, because he was a hemophiliac. He was told not to exercise. I mean, that's dangerous. He started exercising after the fast. It was astonishing. One day I'm going, sit down and lunch, he's not there. Something's amiss. People who just broke their fast don't miss meals. Something's amiss. He shows up almost an hour late. I go, what happened? He says, I got lost. I go, where'd you go? Describe where he went. He was at the base of the cheer portray. He was at the base of the chimney. Okay, he's walked. He's walked four kilometers out and four kilometers back, so he's been about five miles in total. He's gone up a thousand feet and back down a thousand feet. He's been walking for three hours. This is a man who couldn't walk 40 days prior. Right, he was gonna crawl a hundred feet. He just went for a five mile hike. He emailed me when he finished his first triathlon. Now he's into bodybuilding. Over and over and over, the stories are just astonishing stories. People who couldn't eat with ulcerative colitis, couldn't gain weight with malabsorption syndrome. Why? Because when you fast, all facets of anatomy and physiology vector towards health. Just like you go to bed tired and you wake up ready to go. Your body heals itself. When you take an adult-sized portion of rest, can things go wrong when you fast? Yes. Do they usually? No. Do you want to be alone, on your own, or surrounded by family when things go wrong? No. Do you want to have professional help, experienced help around? Yes. Do you have questions when you fast? Endless. <laughs> Do they seem ridiculously important to you? Yes. Are they usually? No. <laughs> but are they to you right then? Yes. The biggest factor that adversely affects your fast is fear. It's fear. You're going into the unknown. Have you ever walked through the woods and not really known how to come out the other side and wondered? Have you ever felt that fear? Have you ever gone paddling out into the ocean further than you'd ever been and then suddenly just felt fear? Have you ever been on a road just trying to get somewhere driving where you're pretty darn safe and you realize like you don't have a clue how to get where you're going and there's fear. Now, you haven't eaten in 10 days or 12 days or 18 days. From the second you began your fast, your brain only says one thing to you. Eat. Eventually, it uses different tactics. It says, you've proven your point. You are the master of your domain. You could not eat if you so choose. 
Now the tea. <laughs> I bow in deference to your total ability to control your desires. Now the tea. You know, it's really not that important whether you eat or not. So let's eat. <laughs> Double, triple, quadruple, quintuple, sextuple, reverse psychology. You don't know if you're coming or going, but for 24 hours a day, every single day, the entire time you fast, your brain is going to say, eat. My mom calls me up on day 24 of my fast. I fasted 30 days on my fifth fast. She says, I'm in Georgia. She's in New Jersey. She says, do I have to come down there and feed you? I go, Mom, I promise I'm going to eat. I'm really looking forward to eating. Just not right now. I'm not even hungry. She gave me a few more days. There's a book called The Miracle of Fasting. Oh my gosh, if there really are miracles, there's probably only two. There's The Miracle of Fasting and O's, Perlman. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, obviously the miracle is sperm and egg. One plus one makes one. And that, that beats everything that ever happened. One plus one makes one, that's a miracle. Making life, that's so cool. But Fasting would be right up there. I've seen people with chronic fatigue sleep 600 hours in a month. I had a guy sleep for 72 hours nonstop. Serious chronic fatigue. Oh, 72 hours nonstop, twice in one week. That was a good week for him. That went by well. Okay, he woke up now and then to pee and have a sip of water, but he doesn't even remember any of that. He was just asleep. Unable to hold a job beforehand, came out as a full-time gardener afterwards. Working in the Florida heat, no problem. Had a lady with chronic fatigue. She worked, she worked in the movie industry. She started working four days a week, three days a week, two days a week, one day a week. At one day a week, she goes, you know, I'm really not being all that productive anymore. I can't work more than one day a week. I'm down. I had a girl who was living 12 hours a day in a water-filled sound isolation tank because gravity was too much. Took a fast, both of them took a fast, come out absolutely, perfectly healthy, normal, happy individuals, fully productive, full-time job, boyfriends, doing sports, the whole thing, as if that was normal now, which it is. Chronic fatigue, how about like a chronic rest? I have people with blood pressure so hot. Most of the people with high blood pressure come to me when there's no more medication that'll keep their blood pressure under control. Then they come to fast. And it just goes down, 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 down. No. It, it almost hasn't seemed to matter what the situation is. You're in the fast. We run our fast differently than most people run theirs. We look in on you many times during the course of the day. We expect you to come to lectures if you wish, and if you don't, we look in on you a little extra. We don't want to leave anybody alone for more than a little period of time before we know how they're doing and make sure they don't have a problem or a need or a care or a concern, because that's not resting. Laying there worrying isn't resting. I run an educational program that's usually three to four hours every single day for many reasons. One is because if all you do is fast and go home, there's a very good chance that you're going to go home and reinstate the same problems that caused you to need to fast. 
Two, if you don't know more than you did before, you're not gonna go home with any more motivation to take great care of yourself than you had before. Three, that sure helps the day go by. <laughs> but I think the education is invaluable. And so there's a lecture every single day on many, many different topics related to fasting. We don't talk about food. We'll talk about that after the fast. We'll talk about getting fit again after the fast. The biggest flaw I've seen with most fasting retreats is that they fast you as long as possible because they think that's how to get the most benefit for your fast and then send you home as quickly as possible. I've met many, many people who went to a three week program and fasted for either 19 or 20 days. I'll tell you what, after 19 or 20 days of not eating, when you start eating, after three or four days and your appetite comes back, you are hungry. And I've seen many people blow it after just a couple of days of eating because they were left to their own devices. I teach my fasters that I start working when the fast ends. Now you have the energy to consider your emotions. Now you have the energy to start learning about exercise. Now you have the energy to start asking the questions. Now we want to talk about food. Now we got to talk recipes. Now we got to talk about how do we deal with other people and all the things that are going to allow you to successfully get through becoming a healthier person. There's a lot of work to do. And bodily function. Amazingly enough, most people start asking me about bodily function. Things we don't usually talk about here. Now, I don't think in this entire festival with, with goodness knows how many talks and tons of people, even tons of them eating. Is there anybody here who ate differently than they did at home? Okay. It's a little different for some people here. There wasn't any lectures on poop. How to, when to, what's normal, what's not. Tell you what, when you fasted, you're willing to talk about poop with your doctor. And all the other bodily functions that men don't usually talk to ladies about or we don't talk to anybody else about or whatever it was. You develop some really tight relationships with people. But I work after a fast. Helping people to reestablish healthy eating habits for two, I mean the most poignant thing anybody said to me at this entire event, the lady today said, this was just fantastic. It was just fantastic. She said, I've been wavering back and forth. I, I've known her for 15 years. She said, I've been wavering back and forth on the raw thing and the vegan thing for ages and ages. She said, it takes time to develop habits. I wish this event was three weeks long. By the end of three weeks, I'd have this kind of eating mastered. I don't think she would master it in three weeks, but in three weeks, she'd certainly have a chance to have seen what she needs to see in order to continue easily doing it at home. It takes a little time to develop a habit. I don't rush people home. I want people to recover with me from their fast for at least, for minimum, half the length of the fast. Absolute minimum. If you fast 14 days, you need seven days. Minimum. Fasting is not the experience that I'm not certain I've had one person ever come fast with me who had the experience they thought they were going to have. Some people had relatively easy fasts, uneventful fasts. They didn't have tar coming out from under their armpits or 
projectile vomiting for a week. They didn't see God. I've had people do that stuff. They didn't have pain so severe that unless there were hot water packs on their back, hot water bottles on their back, they couldn't stand the kidney pain. They didn't break out in boils or sweats or hives or whatever else sort of things that happen. They didn't, I wouldn't mention that. They didn't hemorrhage uncontrollably. <laughs> they didn't have foot and leg pain so severe that they couldn't put their feet on the floor. Seen lots of really strange things happen during the fast. They didn't have visions or hallucinations or fear, even fear. They had uneventful fasts. And they come to me and they go, I'm really disappointed. I'm not having any kind of healing crises at all. I'm going, you really want like a week of nausea? <laughs> you really want black stuff coming out your umbilicus? I mean, are you sure? <laughs> your body is cleaning house for you. 24-7 since before you were born and will continue to do so until the second you die. And you usually don't know anything about it and you're just as happy not to. And during a fast, it's doing the same thing and you're just as happy. You're lucky if you don't know about it. You don't really want to have healing crises. Oh, my knees hurt so bad when I fasted, somebody told me. My knees hurt so bad. I go, when did you, did you ever hurt me? She go, you know, when I was a kid, I hurt both knees. They haven't hurt for decades, but now they hurt like crazy. I know they're healing. And then after the fast, better than ever. I, I could talk about fasting for a month. In Costa Rica, I talked more than 100 hours in the course of a little more than a month. It's just about fasting and the miracle it creates in bodies and the hundreds of case histories that I can remember. And we'll talk about three or four of them every single day. But here, I always believe that your questions are more important to you than anything else I could tell you. So. I will close by letting you know that, yes, indeed, I am offering a fast this September, a two-week fast program with a one-week extension option. The price is absurd. We just recently lowered it. I can't tell you the number, but it's absurdly low because I'd rather have it be a full event than hold people away. The people who already paid for it are going to get a refund as well so that everybody's there on the same boat ride. It's going to be followed by Banana Island for a week, for those of you who wish to come and have a life-changing experience in eating. Educational programs every day, fitness classes every day, but the food will be relatively focused around bananas. It won't be only bananas. It's Banana Island, but there's other stuff growing on the island. But for those of you who wish to get your eating habits under control, a week of really simple. You come back to here and it's like, wow, a smorgasbord of food. Which I think this was. I never went into the kitchen when there wasn't food. I couldn't always choose what to have, but there was always food. So we finished the fast with a feast. Down in Costa Rica, I run a fast once a year. That's usually about a 35 to 38 day program. It's followed by my walking tour in Costa Rica. People stay for two weeks to the 
biggest and best 80-10-10 party of every year. It's glorious. If you're thinking maybe fasting might be something you're interested in, feel free to talk to me or any of the members of my staff. They've all been to my fasting programs. Katie fasted. Katie used to be 700 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Jerome's coming to fast. We're gonna give. We're gonna. You think you'll get over that French accent? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> no, that's an asset. Grant fasted. Grant fasted for like. 29 days. He looked pretty thin at the end of his fast. He had an event that he did every year. It took him about 24 hours. After his fast, he did it in 20, and the next year in 18, and last year in 16. Um, it's a little spooky what's happening post fast. Our food guy, Richard, fasted last year. He said, I really want to improve my running. He cut so much time off of his running that he qualified a couple weeks ago as an All-American in steeplechase. So while you're thanking him for food over the next day or so, be sure to thank Richard, or compliment Richard. He's now an All-American among us. There aren't a lot of 80-10-10 All-Americans, and I believe he may be the first, in fact. There's going to be several Olympians at my upcoming Health and Fitness Week, uh, culinary skills class, and various other seminars. I hope to see you at at least some of them. I hope you'll stay in touch. I look forward to seeing you again and again at the upcoming events, both Woodstock Food Festivals and food and sport events. You can always stay close with us this way. There's no pressure on anyone, but I find that the more you involve yourself, the more you stay in touch, the easier it is to stay on track. Give yourself enough rest. People ask me now, Dr. Graham, do you fast regularly? The answer is no. I attempt to live my life in such a fashion that regular fasting is not required. I don't want to have to make up for my sins. I'll just pass on the sins, thank you. Do I live perfectly? No. Haven't figured that out any more than being in two places at one time. Sometimes I stay up late. It happens. Sometimes I breathe city air. Sometimes I don't get as much exercise as I'd like or weeks like this where I get more than I want. <laughs> we got so much exercise this week that my training partner and myself, Melvin, and I were having so much fun, but we're both getting so tired that when we got into the, we got into what we were doing today, we didn't have a conversation about it per se so much as action. But there was a point where we were pretty well convinced that we could put two heads into the same place at the same time. Uh, that didn't go over real well for my eye. Uh, but I'm pretty well convinced now that you can't put two heads into the same place at the same time. There's lots of ways to not be perfect. It just means more room to strive, more things to practice. I want to keep growing through my entire life. That includes taking great care of myself. I want to find out what my potential to grow, to reach, to develop. I want to be the best I can be, to coin that phrase. And I find for most people that includes a fast. If you're not up for it, fine. If you want to know more about it, please ask me.
Yes. Um, how and who decides when the fast is over of that time? How and who decides when the fast is over? That's a great question. That's a great question because in most situations, in nature, the faster decides when it's over. But nature decides when it starts. The animal falls down a hillside, breaks its leg, it's time to start fasting. And so they do. Because fasting, according to the laws of nature, is the way to optimize healing. Healing happens more rapidly during a fast than at any other time. There are sufficient supplies. There's enough protein, there's enough calcium, there's enough of the stuff available for your bone to heal itself. During a fast, you don't have to eat. And it heals typically twice as fast as if you are eating. It's nature's plan. For us, usually, it's an arbitrary decision as to when the fast begins. It's not totally arbitrary as to when the fast ends. And usually what I prefer is that each individual and I confer. And we use my experience and your essence to come to a conclusion. When would a breaking of the fast be best? So if you've got severe debilitating arthritis, and you say, well, I only want to fast for seven days. Well, you can, but you likely won't be over the arthritis because of all the arthritics I've ever fasted. The range has been 19 days to 30 days. And they always seem, it's, it's really almost always between 21 and 24. That tends to do it. Sometimes 28, once 30, once twice less than a week, once 19 and once 20. But I mean, it's almost always 21, 24, sometimes a little more depending on other things. And depending on your condition, see everybody has a unique condition. Kent has Kent's syndrome. <laughs> Kevin has Kevin's syndrome. We all have unique conditions. We all have been exposed to unique things in life. No two lives are the same. Everybody in the room heard a different story today based on your past life experience and all the other stuff. And so, the best I can do is share with you, make an idea, this is what I would recommend, but at all times, the faster is in charge. I do not take charge, it's your fast. I'm consulting with you, it's your fast. There's only one time that I'm in charge and you've given me permission to be in charge if I believe your life is in danger, then I take over and make decisions. That almost never happens. Just almost never happens. I had a man come to me and wanted to fast and he didn't pass the entrance exam I had him in the hospital for kidney failure. He didn't feel that good. He didn't really tell me why. He came to fast the very next day. That's always a clue. I put and said, let's do a little lab and blood work. Let me just see what's going on. He didn't pass the lab. He didn't pass the blood work. I'm looking at it and I'm going, you're showing kidney failure. Your kidneys are pulling everything out. He was, he was still peeing, but he's pulling protein out, blood out, everything's coming out in the urine. Go to hospital. He's in the hospital for a month before they got him straightened out. I had a guy come down to fast with me one time. He came with his partner, and his, he was 50 years old. He looked 90 at least. He said, I kind of like to party. He said, I can kind of guess. His skin and his eyes, his eyes were egg yolk yellow. His skin was yellow. I mean, his liver had 
lived and was done. He was there for a day until the hospital was done. Never, we never began fasting. There was just no choice. He was there with his partner who saw what went on and said, yeah, I realized it was like a little bit of way too little. It was just exactly the right stuff, but way too late. You know, this guy, it was over before we ever began. So far during the fast, I've never lost anybody. Never have. But it could, but, but could people get better during the fast. They don't get worse. But if there's an emergency, you kind of relinquish control to me. Otherwise, it's your fast, you're in charge, you make the decisions, and I like it that way. I prefer it that way. I'm not looking to run your life for you, but I'm happy to be a guy and share my experience. You had your hand up so long. How did you ever manage? <laughs> If you, have a, if you have a prolonged water fast that's uneventful, does it mean your body's not so toxic? Nope. Doesn't. A, it could mean that you're really good at cleaning house without needing to have events. Okay? Your kidneys are taking care of business, your liver's taking care of business, and they don't need outside events. Uh, it could mean you're so toxic that you can't generate an acute response. Yet, yeah. and I've seen people come, you know, who are really toxic, and they breeze through the first three or four weeks of fasting. This is easy. And they have to get really deep because, for that part, they couldn't generate acute responses. They couldn't generate the healing crises. It doesn't automatically mean that. It would be nice to think so. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is there a minimum amount of water that you have your fasters take? Is there a minimum amount of water? Uh, I use the same program for fasters as we do for people who are eating. We want to stay hydrated. There's times when you need more water. There's times when you need less. Uh, it's a little inconvenient to go to the bathroom 12 times a day when you're fasting and all you want to do is lay in bed. So we tend to put the max range up around 10 rather than 12. And we tend to put the bottom at eight. Uh, by the time people are only peeing six or seven times per day, we are noticing. We're really noticing. There's no emergency, but we're really noticing and recommending that they drink more because as you become even a little bit dehydrated, what you also get is very tired and very irritable. And those are two things that fasters don't need to experience is extra tired or extra irritable. Um, you know, when you're not eating, you get irritable enough. Um, what I want to avoid is somebody becoming so dehydrated that they experience renal shutdown. Because then you're going to the hospital. But we just monitor and use the same recommendations we do for people who are eating, basically. Do you think it's ever worth doing shorter fasts? Um, do I think it's ever worth doing shorter fasts? Well, I do offer a two-week program, so we're looking at about a 10-day fast. I don't recommend the once-a-week fast kind of approach. 50 one-day fast will not give you anything even remotely like the benefits that you'd get from a 10-day fast. Because for the first 18 hours of a fast, or depending on what you eat, 24 or more hours of a fast, your body is running off the food, fuel, and other benefits from what you just ate. You're not into truly the fasting state, typically, for 24 to 48 hours if you're eating the way we eat here. And if you're coming in off a relatively standard Western diet, you might not get into what we recognize as a fasting state for three or four or five days. And so your body has to go through 
a lot of effort to finally get to a point where it's about ready to start fasting, and by then you've ended your fast. I know a lot of people who fast one day a week or who've tried it one day a week. Well, you know, the day before the fast, they eat light. The day after the fast, they tend to eat light. The other four days, they have to eat almost double what they would normally eat, or they're not going to get enough calories in the week. The math says you're going to eat almost double for four days if you eat really if you eat nothing for one and really light for two more. So you now have fasting and binge eating going on on a regular basis. And then you know you're fasting every Monday for three or four weeks or ten or twelve or twenty. And this past weekend you ran your heart out in a big ultra event. You just had so much fun. You did play two rounds of golf a day for three days in a row or whatever it was, you were super, super active and it's Monday and it's your fasting day and you're really not looking forward to fasting. You want to feast. Oh, but I fast every Monday. It's like the guy down in Miami Beach that runs every day on the beach. So he's in the hospital, but he's got like a 34 year record or something of running every day. 37, he's run every day on the South Beach. So he just got out of the hospital, went and ran. And he was, do you think maybe staying in the hospital might have been more important than going for that day's run? I don't know. I don't know all the details, but you know, you get a string going, a streak of anything, we all don't want to break our streak. We all like to keep this. So I you come to fast every Monday, and, and then you start coming to hate Mondays. Dread Mondays. I mean, what's the no, I don't see the health benefit, nor do I see the psychological benefit. You're setting yourself up with something really arbitrary that, oh, is there some mental strength benefit that might be accrued from doing that a few times? Yeah, of course. Beyond that, not a health benefit. Why doctors don't recommend or use fasting in hospitals? Why don't doctors recommend or use fasting in hospitals? A, because they're not trained in fasting in their schooling in America. In hospitals in Russia, they use fasting. My understanding is that in Russia, all mental illness is treated through fasting. Huh. I don't know that that's 100% true today, but certainly when I was studying, uh, this was the case. With excellent results, we've seen schizophrenics, bipolar disorder, acute sadness, uh, just all sorts of mental aberration straighten right up with relatively short facts. Why don't they hear? I mean, I could be, say something unkind about the medical doctors. <laughs> they're not really looking for people to get well. That would work against them, and they wouldn't have patients. I wouldn't say that. Yes? Is it ideal to be fairly lean before fasting? Is it ideal to be fairly lean before fasting? Not necessary in any way to be fairly lean. I don't recommend fasting as a weight loss procedure, but you will lose weight when you fast. Uh, is it ideal to be fairly lean in general? Yes, I believe so. I think lean is, is good. We don't see fat mammals as a rule in nature. We just don't see it. Lean is in, in the natural plan. Typically during a fast, you lose two pounds of fat per week. Two pounds of fat per week. That's it. About 1,000 calories a day, 7,000 a week, 3,500 in a pound. You lose about two pounds a week. Is it true that when you don't eat for a long time, you like, run out of fat, your body starts like, taking it from your organs and bones and stuff? I hear that all the time. If you run out of fat, Yes, it is true. If you run out of fat, you will start to starve. You will go beyond the fasting state into starvation. But to run out of fat is far lighter than most people think. An average guy in this room, to run out of fat would probably have to be under 100 pounds. 
pretty much all of the guys here that I see, there's nobody huge, you know, super high, tall. Um, for the average lady here in this room to run out of fat, uh, you'd have to probably be somewhere around 60 pounds before you ran out of fat. It's pretty light. Our perspective, okay, our perspective of lean is already skewed from the last 20 years of what we see every day in and day out. We, people tell me I'm emaciated looking. But they're 300 pounds in telling me that. No thin people tell me I'm emaciated looking. I've been 100 pounds. I know what that's like as an adult. That's pretty lean. <laughs> but I didn't want to stay at 100 pounds. But I wanted to get whatever was in my system out and rebuild from there. So our, our idea of what's lean, I mean, if you actually check the stats on the weights of the people who walked out of Auschwitz, that's lean. And they're still working all day in the factories at Auschwitz. You check their weights and you go, oh, well they're the same height as us, but they weighed about half what we weigh. And we're lean. So, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, actually running out of fat is biafra. Okay. The kids who run out of fat are now starting to eat into their abdominal musculature for fuel, and the only thing holding their abdomen in is skin. And that's why their belly is swollen, because their abdominal musculature is shot. So is that actually when cachexia sets in, or is that something different? You want to define cachexia for everyone? I'm wasting away the body. When the body starts to eat itself. The body will start to, that's what, and the reason I'm saying that is because cachexia, as I understand it, can occur for various reasons at various times. But the body, the body's pretty smart about how it goes about doing so. The body will always choose the resources that are least essential to the body. Which is why when you start losing weight, you don't eat up your muscles. Why you don't lose muscle on a fast. You lose fat. You lose unnecessary proteinaceous waste. The number of people who have various growths that fall off or disappear, tumors, cysts, and on through a list of bumps and knobs and crusts and stuff. It either falls off or becomes absorbed. And that all fall, falls under a, a category that in hygiene I would call autolysis. Your body is breaking itself down to use itself for fuel, but in a healthy way. Nobody goes blind. The body, even in starvation, people don't go blind because the eyes are an essential structure. When a person dies of starvation, their heart is perfect. It has not been affected one cell worth because the essential structures are spared. So what we're calling cachexia is happening in an organized way all the time. I don't know if that helps answer your question at all, or we can talk about it later. One or two more, it must, it must be 5.30 by now. Ah. <laughs> oh, yes. I was just curious, like you said on uh, other fasting, uh, like lemon fasting or uh, OCR fasting, why do you choose water over other types of fasting? The reason I choose pure water fasting so that we can actually get into the deep state of relaxation that is accompanied by the total shutdown of the digestive system. If we add any food or any flavor into the digestive system, you turn on digestive organs from mouth to anus. 
50 feet worth of structures and related organs that aren't, you know, your liver kicks in, your pancreas kicks in, your spleen kicks in, things that we don't even think of as necessarily part of the digestive system per se. Gallbladder is involved, over and over. There's a lot of work up to, for most of us, almost 30% of the calories used each day are spent running the digestive tract. Well, I'm looking to take that 30% and put it into rebuilding vitality, into house cleaning, into the other necessary structures and functions that are required for the body to heal during this resting state. So for me, straight water does the job. Um, I look at a juice feast or a juice diet or, I mean there's benefit in eating clean. There's benefit in eating fairly simple. The people who go, well yes, what I had was cayenne, lemon, and honey. And I'm going, what happened to whole food? What happened to fresh food? Where did, why is honey better than fruit for cleaning house? Where's your vegan ethic? Uh, all sorts of things come up, you know, where I would say, I'm not looking to do a cleanse, per se. What we're looking to do is to get healthier. I'm not trying to flush the body. People, you know, there's bunches and bunches of different kinds of flushes and cleanses. Most of them include a fair amount of stimulation and irritation, and I'm not looking for that to happen. We want the body to rest into health. Like the natural model says, you know, go to bed, wake up feeling better. So that's the approach that I use. Yeah, um, that's okay. I forgot the answer to. It's rare when I look at people or tell them or suggest to them that their fast is an emergency. Those cases certainly do come up where fasting is an emergency, but they're rare. Not only are they rare, but I'm not in a rush to reach for my ace up my sleeve modality of fasting last hope, fasting, first. I'd rather see you live healthfully for a while, especially if there's time. A, because fasting might not be required. But B, because after your fast, you're going to go back to eating the way you ate before your fast. That's the easiest thing to do. It's tough to eat standard American diet, come to a fast, get introduced to the 80-10-10 diet, and go home eating it when your house is full of everything but. And the no, no experience, no successes, no knowledge of how to go about it. So I'd rather see somebody eat for six months or a year, eat 80, 10, 10, say, look, you know, I've done everything I can. I, I'm still just, I, I mean, I feel better than I did a year ago, but not enough so I feel like I'm, it's just not right. Now fast, then in your dreams, you're dreaming about bananas and watermelon rather than pizza and cheeseburgers. So I'm not in a rush to get people fasting. Sometimes it's just opportune. You know, I've got a fast for the last two weeks of September and you've been thinking about it for a long time and it's opportune. But typically I'd rather see people eat well, fast, go back to the old friend of eating well again, rather than have to learn all that stuff. I 
I see eyesight improvement on fast almost every single time. Pretty much almost every single time. Lots of people come with glasses and go home without them. That's a real common experience. Yes. I have athletes come to my fast every year. The results are predictable. They're going to be better athletes after the fast than before. It's predictable. It's all but, I mean, it's guaranteed. You're going to be a better athlete. Because what you're doing, various people have various names for it. But you are essentially rejuvenating yourself when you fast. You are making yourself younger. Victoris Kolinsky calls it youth aging. Okay. At which point I start thinking, oh, well, it's euthanasia. Um, it's, it's you think. You're making yourself younger. You're turning back the clock. You're resetting your anatomy and physiology to a healthier, earlier time when you hadn't been exposed to so many toxins, carcinogens, mutagens, and the genetic template that reproduces cells and keeps them reproducing themselves as normal and healthy, exactly like the ones, it's still cookie cutter clean. It's right, because it's a template. Cells keep reproducing themselves. And as the template starts to get a little rough around the edges, this is one of the explanations of how aging occurs. So uh, the people who rely on speed are faster. The people who rely on endurance are, have more of it. The people who rely on strength have more of that. Fasting invariably leaves people stronger than before their fast. But not instantaneously. Depending on the length of the fast, it could easily take three to six to for the really long fast, I'm, I'm talking to athletes saying, look, don't even expect peak performances before nine months from now. But it happens every single time. I haven't seen a case where people haven't been better athletes after than before, unless they did something else wrong. Which sometimes happens. But if they're doing the program and they're training normal and they're doing all the right things the right way, as it were, doing all the right things in the right way, invariably better athletes after than before. Flexibility improves dramatically, which strength improves, meaning power improves, meaning speed improves, endurance goes unlimited. So I think it's pretty good. Yes? Yes, we put people in, we recommend people get sunlight every single day during their fast. And it's part of why I use Costa Rica in January and February because it never rains during that time. And part of why I use Sedgwick, Washington during September because it almost never rains in September in Sedgwick, Washington. So you get plenty of sun. Um, I don't know how to compare a short dry fast to a short water fast. Because I don't recommend or do short water fast as a therapeutic procedure to have ever compared one to the other. Short. How long is short? Well, I'm sure you're not going to ask somebody to dry fast more than a day or two. So we're talking about a very Sure, fast indeed. I don't even know how to measure what's going on exactly, but if I was going to try to figure it out, and the problem was dehydration, maybe short, dry fast might not be smart. The cool thing about dry fasting for short periods of time is that, as we've all seen, when you stop eating salty food, you release tons of water during the first four or five days of a fast. It's pretty common for a man to lose eight to 10 pounds of water. 
So he's not dehydrated for the first four or five days, even if he doesn't drink any water at all, because he's losing water like crazy. And, we'll drop, and ladies can do about 50 to 60% of that. And so in the first three or four days, if you want to do a dry fast, um, I'm not recommending it intentionally. I'd rather not risk kidney function. But I can't say that it's a more, a more effective modality than wet fast, if that's what we want to call it, or water fast. Uh, the fasts that I'm using are, are of much longer duration. And, and it's the kind of thing that would be deadly were it a dry fast. So we just don't, we just don't even look at it. I want, to, I want people to be hydrated because that's when they're at their healthiest. She was from France, she was a businesswoman. She took the month of December off every single year, went to a fasting center and fasted someplace beautiful in the world. She came to me once. She says, that way, I don't have to worry about what I do the 11 other months. No, I heard what you said about that. Okay, so that was her approach. She says, I can do whatever I want for the other 11 months because I'm gonna fast once a year and make up for it. I, you know, I'm not going to go that route particularly. Um, certainly fasting once a year, is, if you're taking a longer fast, giving yourself a full year to recover is wise. What, what is the question that I'm missing? it's a waste of time to fast more than once in your life. As, as I mentioned, I fasted five times right. before it became kind of 